Hi guys. It is a beautiful midwinter day here in the middle of April in uh, the Orwellian police state lockdown here in Garfield, Texas. It is Wednesday, April 15th. Halfway through the month of April. I know there's something we're supposed to be doing on April 15th, but I can't remember just what it is. So anyway, what I have got to do with uh, this beautiful winter day in April is your old pathetic apocaloptimist has to uh, spend the rest of his day trying to save a dead 150-year-old <coughs> cottonwood tree. Oh yeah, that <coughs> that's really going to happen. <coughs> this dry cough is... Uh, driving me crazy the past couple of days. Anyway, oh yes, I am Sam Mitchell, and this is my little co-pilot Sancho Panza in his little snowman sweater in April. And this is, is this Collapse Chronicles or Chronicles or Corona Panic? I think we'll start off with our uh, daily Corona Panic Chronicle, uh, which, is, which is also this this serves both, and and I've mentioned this before, so I'm going to do one more round about this because there's still some confusion out here, some absolute myth that the Corona panic is good for our fellow Earthlings. Uh, I Vegematic brother, uh, I, I I love you, man, but you are still promulgating this myth that the corona panic is good for uh, the planet and our fellow earthlings. So uh, I want to thank good old Book Hermit once again. Uh, good old Book Hermit for sending me. Uh, are you going to stay or are you going to get down? We're going to stay. All right. Uh, for sending me the latest story, now, National Geographic had a similar story a few days ago. This is from this outfit called The Conversation. More and more, I've noticed, I'm getting more and more uh, ideas for videos from The Conversation. And this is written by a fellow named Charlie Gardner, who is a lecturer in conservation science from the University of Kent which I'm assuming is in England. Uh, so let a conservation scientist explain to you why the corona panic is not good for our fellow earthlings. <clears throat> Nature's comeback? No, the coronavirus pandemic threatens the world's wildlife. Yes, this is another example of frying pan or the fire. If the economy keeps chugging right along, it's the end of our fellow earthlings. If the economy collapses, it is the end of our fellow earthlings. <clears throat> there have been many bright spots in the corona panic, but one... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've already blown this. My uh, 99 cent made in China glasses are getting pretty scratched up here. <clears throat> Start over. There have not been many bright spots in the corona panic, but one has been the apparent return of nature and the frantic pace as the frantic pace of modern life has slowed. We have seen fish eating birds return to the clear waters of Venice, wild boar roaming the streets of Bergano, and of course, the feral mountain goats of Landudo. In Britain, wildlife seems set for a bountiful spring and summer. Fewer cars on the road means less roadkill, and many birds and voles those are little mice, will be spared as owners decide to keep their cats inside. You know that cats can 
get the coronavirus, uh, if you're not aware of that. In towns and cities, wildflowers will surely flourish as councils realize that mowing their parks is somewhat less than essential. Nature, it seems, is making a comeback. Unfortunately, this is but a partial picture, yes, and one that is limited to the minority world of industrialized nations. Most of the world's biodiversity is found in the low-income countries and emerging economies of the global south, and in such places the economic impacts of the pandemic are likely to be devastating for the natural world, and this is, uh, you know, this is once again, this has nothing to do with the virus. A uh, little unclear about cats, about the big cats. Uh, shut up. Uh, <clears throat> This is about, you know, all of these economic lockdowns to prevent, supposedly, the spread of this virus. Okay, you do understand what we're talking about here is the overreaction, the Orwellian police state overreaction of swatting a mosquito with a sledgehammer. That is the aspect of the coronavirus that is going to send millions upon millions of our fellow earthlings directly into the stew pot uh, as millions and millions of people have no way to make money to feed themselves. Uh, anyway, so now with that, just so you understand what we're talking about, what this conservationist scientist is trying to tell you. Okay, the difference lies in how people respond to the economic shock of losing their livelihoods. Social safety nets are a widespread feature of many industrialized economies, keeping the poor and vulnerable from destitution and the importance of the welfare state has never been more obvious <clears throat> than during the pandemic. In the UK, for example, the government's furlough scheme guarantees that people unable to work will receive 80% of their incomes. You get that squirrely like that. And now my, uh, my cursor God damn it, my cursor has frozen up. Thank you. All right, uh, but citizens of many low-income countries simply do not have such backups from their governments, leaving them incredibly vulnerable. For many, the forest and the ocean will provide their safety net. And you know what that means. And of course, guys, where we're talking about here more than anywhere, ground zero of this is sub-Saharan Africa. And before I continue, once again, uh, I, I'm going to say that what we're seeing already with corona, uh, with the corona panic, already ramping up in the slaughter of our fellow earthlings is a tiny snapshot of what we can expect to see uh, over the balance of this century is more and more of these economic shocks uh, that are going to make the corona panic look like a bad hair day in comparison Okay, as more and more of these economic shocks continue to roll in on top of each other, as they are going to do, it is doomsday for 
uh, every one of our fellow Earthlings, and uh, particularly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You, you know, after they have eaten every one of our fellow Earthlings have gone into the stew pot, after they have chopped down every single tree, what next? Take a wild guess. Anyway, I'm going to try to stay out of this rant and get back to what was this fellow's name? Charlie Gardner uh, from the Conservation Scientist. Okay, take it away. Back to Charlie. I will try to shut up now. <clears throat> Exploiting natural resources is often the only option for the destitute. Wild animals, fish, and forest trees are rarely owned by anyone, and they are found in rural areas where policing is difficult. What's more, there are often few technical barriers to exploiting them. You don't need a degree to be able to wield an axe. So, when people are left with nothing, they can always find something to eat or sell in the forest. I saw this firsthand in a decade spent living in Madagascar, which is rich in lemurs and other unique creatures, but is also one of the world's poorest nations. My research has shown that when Madagascar's people lose their source of income due to climate change induced natural disasters, they often turn to natural resources to make ends meet. <coughs> Farmers suffering from drought may head to the forest to produce charcoal or to practice slash and burn agriculture. Others head to the coast to fish but lacking the necessary skills and equipment, they rely on destructive techniques like poison fishing and also just dynamite fishing. The impacts can be devastating for biodiversity. <clears throat> of course, the coronavirus pandemic is even <clears throat> a greater threat to livelihoods than climate change in the short term. Uh, so once again, this is a snapshot to what climate change is going to look like, this short term threat. Following the last financial crisis in 2008, which is, which is a bad hair day compared to the corona panic uh, crisis today, unemployed workers in Cameroon turned to poaching and deforestation in a desperate attempt to maintain their incomes, and a similar story will now be unfolding worldwide. In India, Millions of migrant workers have lost their jobs in cities and returned to their family villages, a mass movement of people not seen since partition in 1947. A similar thing is happening in Madagascar as well, as it is throughout Africa and much of the tropics. Nobody knows what impacts this unprecedented rural exodus will have, but it is clear that many more people will be finding themselves poorer, hungrier, and much closer to exploitable wildlife than they were a few weeks ago. Yep. At the same time, the surveillance and management of our precious wild places is considerably weakened. Governments are understandably preoccupied with public health, so there is less law enforcement in rural areas. Meanwhile, the shutdown of global tourism has pulled the financial rug out from thousands of protected areas, leaving them without an operational budget 
for anti-poaching surveillance and other activities. Worse still, a long-term drop in tourism revenues may radically change the incentives for people living close to wildlife. Millions of people coexist with the animals around the edges of African parks and reserves, but it is not always harmonious. Wild animals can, and often do, raid crops, attack livestock, and even kill people. Revenues from tourism can offset some of the costs local people pay and provide an incentive for conservation, but this fragile coexistence may not last if visitors stay away. May not last. Well, who are you kidding? Uh, so, while the newly emboldened wildlife of western cities brings joy in these dark times and a welcome reminder of nature's resilience, the world's wildlife will not be saved by a temporary economic lull. To achieve that, we are going to have to ensure conservation moves to the top of the agenda in the post-pandemic world. Oh yes, I'm sure uh, conservation is going to move to the top of the agenda in the post-pandemic world. Uh, Charlie Gardner is a researcher at the Durrell Institute of Conservation and Ecology at the University of Kent and has worked for a range of environmental, <clears throat> non-governmental uh, organizations in Madagascar and of course on a planet of seven, um, what am I saying, uh, eight billion people we have exactly 39 comments to that story, which says as, mu as much as anything in the story that nobody cares what happens to our fellow earthlings. The, the, the news about our fellow earthlings, any sort of environmental news, and I would say concern, uh, has completely evaporated. It is all about humans, humans, humans. Anyway, uh, I've got to, I think we're going to come back uh, with, uh, we're going to come back with today's Collapse Chronicle about how coral reefs have completely collapsed with no help from the coronavirus in our <clears throat> chronicle of the collapse coming up in one minute. Stay tuned. Bye guys.